Hi, everyone. Huge thanks to four years from now for having me today, and thanks all of you uh, for your time this morning. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about Twitter today. This is, a, a, for me at least, a fairly unusual presentation, working so much with product and with the sales teams. Typically, we're talking about our marketing solutions. Uh, today, I wanted to take a slightly different tack and talk a little bit about kind of where we've come from and where we're going with mobile technology. So I want to start off. It sounds a little strange, but I want to uh, show of hands how many people have seen the movie Back to the Future. So pretty much everyone in the room. I was afraid no one would know what I'm talking about, because uh, one thing I wanted to do was revisit this movie, movie for a second. I don't know if people remember this, and there's been some news coverage, but Back to the Future 2, they're in 1985, I believe, in the movie. But the date they're going to is actually 2015. And it's actually October, so we've got a few months between now and then. Um, but I think this is a pretty interesting uh, study of sorts to look at, in 1985, what they viewed the world of technology, and in some ways, loosely speaking, mobile technology to look like in 2015. So I won't go through all the comparisons. There's a lot of articles on this. I'll say two quick things. One, I'm glad that they got fashion wrong, and I'm not up here in two neckties. And two, I'm personally very disappointed that the hoverboards do not exist yet. Actually, they, they do in a prototype. Uh, company Hendo Hoverboards has this, but it has to be on a certain type of metal. And trust me, I tried everything in my power to ride one of those in here, because I know that if I did, I could pretty much be reading from a dictionary, and it would be the best speech most people ever heard. Um, but I couldn't find the hoverboard, so back to business. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how they viewed mobile technology in particular. And they got a lot of things right. And to be fair, if you think about, very loosely speaking, cellular technology, that existed from the late 70s. And who could uh, forget the image from Wall Street of Michael Douglas on the beach? This was certainly high tech at the time. Um, but it went beyond mobile technology, right? They got, they got a few things in the movie very correct, at least on the surface. So they had video goggles, not too dissimilar from Google Glass, maybe a little less dorky, actually. Um, they had video screens and real-time video-to-video communication, not too different from Skype. And they had a sort of instant messaging, granted a paper version, but not too different, considering this is 25 years ago, from a lot of the communications tools we have today in real-time. Um, but they got also got a lot wrong in the sense that although they got some of the technology right, and this is on the surface kind of mobile technology, they got a few things fundamentally wrong because they didn't connect the dots, right? This technology in many ways, the, the photo screens, the uh, live faxes and things like that were connected to landline phones. And there, I, I guess I'd like to think through a couple reasons for that. Thinking back to 25 years ago, what couldn't we possibly anticipate that's happened over the last few decades? And I, it all comes down to three things in my mind. I want to review each of these in a little bit of detail. The first one is widespread internet adoption. I think every, now this seems obvious, right? Um, the whole world is connected, and that connectivity is moving into the mobile space. But taking a step back and looking at kind of where we've come from here. One more slide. Um, looking at where we've come from here, we basically went to zero people online, and that's not exactly true. The internet, again, existed in some form or another since the, the late 60s, but it really didn't get any kind of traction until 1995. And in 15 short years, we went from zero to nearly four billion people online, roughly half the world. Um, and that's a pretty amazing thing and probably something that none of us could have predicted uh, 25 years ago. So looking, thinking about this a different way, it's not just the presence of internet, but the massive, massive increase in computing power that's happened over the last uh, 25 years. So just to put some of this in perspective, if you think through the, the latest iPhone, the iPhone 6, and put that into 1995 terms, right when the internet kind of started gaining traction, an iPhone 6 today has over 25 uh, times the computing power 
of the kind of top of the line PCs at the time in 1995, the uh, Pentium. Again, looking at this slightly differently to put it in perspective, Apple on the iPhone 6 launch weekend actually sold more computing power, um, 25 times more CPU transistors than were in all the PCs on Earth in 1995. So this is pretty phenomenal growth. And actually, I think if I go back to the last slide, I, I misstated this 625 times the computing power in the iPhone 6 versus the Pentium, 25 times the power of all the PCs that were on Earth at the time. And so looking at this, maybe it's not surprising again in retrospect. If you look at how technology has evolved, starting from on the left of the slide, really the, the first instance of mainstream computers, granted in the enterprise world, mainframes. Each successive uh, major shift in computing has been exponential growth from the previous cycle. So roughly 10 times the growth. And if you map this out uh, to mobile, what you see is this tremendous multiplier effect that's happened. So that's sort of the, the second phenomena that I think no one could have predicted, but fundamentally shaped the development of mobile. And the last one is, really ubiquitous mobility. And what I mean by this is I don't think anyone in 1985 and 1995, probably in 2005, could have predicted just how widespread true mobile technology would become. Looking at this kind of, again, back to the data here, what you see is PC sales, PC sales kind of growing steadily over time. And then all of a sudden, mobile takes off like a hockey stick. It's now way outpacing um, PC sales. And when you project that out a few more years, it, it's not even close. And I think all of this has combined together. I don't know who saw the latest, uh, the current Economist issue, uh, but they actually ran an entire issue on mobile effectively being the defining technology of our era. And I think one important stat they talk about, and I think this is, uh, speaks to how far we're going, is that 80% of the adult population will have a smartphone by 2020. So as far as we've come, it will basically be the entire world connected in just a few years. And as you can see, that's uh, significantly more people than have access to electricity, improved water, and some pretty fundamental um, pieces of our life in terms of traditional technologies. And this, another thing about this is it, it will be truly global. So if you take a look at Sub-Saharan Africa, oops, Sub-Saharan Africa, if you look at the coverage right now, it's still uh, going way beyond, in terms of mobile coverage, where electricity is. If you project that out into the future, not only will 70% have coverage of, for some form of mobile device, but a huge percentage of the population uh, will have <coughs> 3G coverage and effectively have a smartphone. A huge part of this is the fact that smartphone prices have come down pretty dramatically. There is actually a $35 Android phone uh, that's available in Africa, and that's dramatically shaping society. It's not just the amount of people that have phones, but how they're using those phones and how they're, they're shifting kind of where the internet has, has come from. So if you think about uh, historically the vast majority of internet use being on PCs, that model is now turned on its head. Not only is it on mobile, but more than half of the time spent accessing some form of internet is a through mobile app, so roughly 52%. Uh, percent. And if you look at the year-over-year -year growth rate, this is pretty incredible, 52% year-over-year growth rate in mobile app usage. So all of this has kind of combined for this perfect uh, storm, in a sense, of societal change, I think. And if you look at those three factors and the way they interact, the bigger story, I think, is really over the last few years or even last 25 years, what this, the shape, how this has shaped society, what the effect was on society as a whole. And so I, that's where I want to focus a few minutes here uh, in terms of what mobile has changed about the way we, inter we interact, going back to my title, how it has shaped our lives. So thinking about how it's changed communication, again, looking back, this seems obvious. I'll put this part through the lens of Twitter um, because I do, I'm biased, but I think it's a perfect barometer for kind of measuring how conversation and communication is evolving. Um, it took us roughly three years and a couple months to have our first billion tweets on the platform. We now have that amount of tweets every two days, and that time period is shrinking uh, day by day. So the volume of communication, the focus of communication, and the mobility of that communication is fundamentally different 
than anything we could have anticipated. It's not just communication between one another, though. A huge impact this has had, and again, this is not Twitter specific, um, but a huge impact mobile communication has had on the world has really been in the form of government and how we participate in government. So if you think back to, in this case, the 60s, and this is Kennedy's uh, election night when Kennedy was elected, uh, what happened here, this is kind of a celebration in the privacy of their living room. Uh, it was a few people who knew what was going on, had the inside scoop, and then the news reported this. Uh, the, Kennedy won the election, this came out later, and then people could react to it. That model, again, has been fundamentally turned upside down. If you think about Obama's last two campaigns, um, this was happening in real time. In 2008, this was a huge part of his campaign, social media, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. And then in 2012, uh, the first place where he sort of announced his reelection or uh, the, the final you know, tally was on Twitter and on social media. So that model of kind of going from the living room to being out there in social media instead of talking to your family in behind closed doors, he's actually announcing this in public. And it goes beyond just elections, right? It goes to major world events, whether it's um, from a few years ago, the plane la landing in the Hudson River outside New York, uh, the Arab Spring, the Egyptian Revolution, the tragedy and the manhunt in Boston or on the Boston Marathon. All of this happened in a fundamentally different way than the news used to be reported. It was the people who were involved in the events, first-hand eyewitnesses, who were not part of the media, the government necessarily, were reporting on this, making the news, and the story was unfolding in real time. That's a fundamentally different shift, and that's something we could have never understood or predicted in 1985. Mobile's also changed the way we do business, and there's a lot of different examples of this, and I won't focus uh, too much on it. I thought this, um, this chart was really great from Benedict Evans, and he sort of talks through um, the fact that there are two to three times as many smartphones, or there will be in the near future, as PCs. That, in and of itself, expands the market, and I talked about that a little bit. But the other uh, subtlety here is that each of these smartphones is effectively not just a supercomputer, but a supercomputer that people have on them at all times. So this very much shifts the way uh, the opportunities that consumers have. It very much shifts the way that marketers do business, the way that industries evolve. In a sense, if you think about the mobile business, it went from being a tech business to being a part of every business. And I'll, I'll show some examples of that going forward, but if you think through anything like the um, the shared economy, that is a new industry, a new twist on an industry that if you think through Airbnb, Uber, et cetera, those companies a few years ago even would have likely been designing a technology and selling that in a B2B market effectively to the big hotels, the big uh, car services, et cetera. Smartphones afford them the opportunity to market directly to consumers and change the way that those industries evolve. couple examples here. I think if you think of shopping, obviously there, there's a fundamental difference between brick and mortar shopping, online shopping, and now that's taking it a step further into real-time shopping where you could order something on a phone, have it delivered almost instantaneously. And then the other element of shopping is it went from kind of being a consumer who has to search in things like the yellow pages and having a very uh, small set of feedback on the business or a description of the business to having this real peer-to-peer -peer review of the business. So all of these, there's, like I said, a lot of different ways that we could go on the business side of things and how mobile has shaped things. Those are just a couple examples. I think maybe most importantly, and if you think about movies like Back to the Future and kind of things that we couldn't, as a society, understand how they would develop, uh, one thing, and not always for the better, mobile has tremendously shaped how we interact with one another. Um, so if you, think, if you think about waiting for a bus, waiting for a train in this case, I saw this tweet, I thought it was, it was pretty funny. There is a single person on this train platform not staring at a smartphone, and the tweet is, WTF is wrong with this dude, what's he looking at, the world? Um, another example, maybe not so good, I thought this video was great. I believe this is in California. Doesn't always happen in California. But. A bear is on the loose in a suburban neighborhood. And a man is on his cell phone texting. <laughs> Almost walks right into a bear and gets eaten. So like I said, not always good. And, and 
actually in China, I think, this is the first example I've seen of this, but a separate walkway for people who are on mobile phones, which is pretty phenomenal. Still wouldn't have helped the guy with the bear, maybe, um, but really speaks to how far we've come in terms of uh, human interaction. So in some ways, and I know there's publications on this, in some ways, the more connect as connected as we are, uh, we're more alone. And I think I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that as I turn to kind of looking forward to the next few years. Uh, maybe as Back to the Future shows, there's no real way to predict where exactly the industry is going and how this technology is going to evolve. So I won't necessarily try to predict things. I think I'd like to speak instead to where mobile can go over the next few years. One of the things that's important to me, and not just because you could get eaten by a bear if you have your head in your phone, um, but I think mobile really can drive real-world connectivity. Um, here is, I think, a great example utilizing uh, existing technology. This example is from Twitter. Um, and this is actually a small town in the south of Spain. Folks may be uh, familiar with it. The town is Hun. And it's roughly uh, a couple thousand people. There we go. Um, and what's really fascinating is, and this was not organized by Twitter, this is 100% um, based on the ingenuity of this town and the leadership of this town. But what they chose to do was actually connect the entire town through social media. And so the way this played out is uh, the police all had Twitter handles on their uniforms so that the idea is citizens can communicate with them, report, you know, great uh, brave behavior, report something wrong, um, and have personal accountability for that. And so he here's one example, not with the police. It's a tweet to the mayor of the town saying there's a street lamp that went out. Mayor responds in real time, thanks for letting us know. Names the person by Twitter handle who will fix the light. And then when that happens, this gets tweeted out um, back to the Twitter followers who were in that town. They actually took an extra step here. So a couple things that I thought were really, really fascinating about this. One, um, separate from Twitter verification, they kind of came up with their own system of local verification where you could take your paperwork to town hall, prove that you lived in the town, um, and then have a locally verified Twitter handle through their own uh, administrative system. Uh, that handle then allowed you to book ro conference rooms uh, or public meeting rooms in uh, the town civic center. Um, and remarkably, I believe those rooms were even connected so that if you were, if you were a verified citizen of the town, tweeted at the room, it would effectively pre-book on a calendar system that space for you. So a phenomenal example, I think, of using a technology that exists in the virtual world and redefining human connection in the real world. Here's the mayor of that town. Um, he is verified <laughs> on Twitter, and you can see um, very, very active on Twitter. It's effectively how he communicates with the people in his town, uh, aside from seeing them day to day, uh, but addressing any concerns, complaints, praise that they might have. So that, that's a great example of this. I think there are many more out there, but it's, uh, I think there is a shift happening, and I think what you will see is mobile technology being used to bring people closer together in the real world. The second uh, thing mobile technology can do in the future, and I, I think, I, I hope it does in the future, it could operate as a sort of underlying layer connecting other technologies. So, so what do I mean by this? I think as most folks in this room know, um, the mobile ecosystem today has been growing rapidly. Um, apps, obviously, is the main example of this. There's a phenomenal array of apps out there, which is, by and large, a very, very good thing. I um, mean, you can see some of the stats here. I think one thing from a consumer perspective, from like a societal perspective, uh, that is challenging about this is there is some degree of fragmentation where if everything is happening in one specific app and a person is not necessarily connecting the dot, dots between the universe of opportunities out there, uh, things can get pretty fragmented. And we've seen some examples of this, right? In some cases where I think possibly technology hasn't moved as far as I would have predicted at least a few years ago, whether it's um, payments and the fragmentation that happens there, whether it's health records and some of the fragmentation happening there. That's not necessarily because of apps in those cases, um, but it is something that I think mobile technology can unify going forward. And if you think about the mobile ecosystem, there's an added element of com complexity here. Depending on where you live, who you are, um, 
job, social status, et cetera, you will interact with mobile very differently. So if you compare Facebook users, for example, in San Francisco, um, primarily iPhone users, if you compare them to Facebook users in Delhi, almost exclusively Android users. If you look at browsing in China versus global browsing, again, a pretty stark difference between Android and iPhone. If you look at App Store revenue, skews heavily iPhone. These are all, I think, symptoms of a bigger issue, which is there is fragmentation in the industry. And there's no cure-all solution here. I think one of the things in the near term, very tactical, is app-to-app -app linking, also known as deep linking. At the very least, that creates a bridge between different apps on a device. Um, but that's one short-term thing. I think in the future, we'll see um, other examples of this. We're starting to head in that direction. Uh, Twitter, for example, recently we launched something called While You Were Away. This essentially has um, Twitter is operating in the background. When you log in again, uh, instead of showing you this kind of stream of hundreds or thousands of tweets, it sort of curates the most uh, interesting, most relevant, shows the, that to you as to what you missed while you were gone. If you think through Google Now or Apple Health, these things are mobile, pl mobile uh, apps in a sense, but they're operating in the background seamlessly. And if you look at Apple Health, for example, it's something I've used. It integrates very well with a lot of the other fitness uh, platforms out there. Not all of them, but uh, that's definitely one of the directions we're heading. I think this, the second thing I think mobile can do, sorry, the third thing I think mobile can do, this is misnumbered, the third thing mobile can do, and probably the most important, is to help solve real world problems. So some of these are small problems, or they're not even necessarily a problem, but they make day to day life better. Um, and I've talked a little bit about Airbnb and Uber. Um, but if you think of everything from getting a ride or the choice not to own a, a car in an in a urban area, Uber has enabled that, as have the other uh, car providers out there or ride providers out there. If you look at Waze, it helps you navigate traffic in a very, very clever and intuitive way. If you look at Square, it's starting to solve some of the problems of mobile payments. All of these things are things that if you think back to 1985, or even 1995, even 2005, would have been inconceivable at the time. They're, they're like I said, not necessarily huge societal problems, but it, they are things that happen day to day uh, that mobile makes easier, makes better. That said, there is an opportunity for mobile to solve some of the bigger problems. I, ca I came across this example of actually a gaming technology, Foldit. Um, it, it, it basically, and I'm not, I'm not a big gamer, but um, it, allows players to solve puzzles. So they put one uh, complex scientific puzzle out there around um, discovering facts about a protein um, used to treat the AIDS virus. And within a matter of days, players of this game solved a puzzle that had perplexed scientists for a number of years. So this is maybe uh, a rare example, but one that I think sim symbolizes the power of mobile and the power that we have going forward to solve real world problems. So before I finish up, I wanted to tie this back to the movie. Um, so it, we talked a little bit about what the movie got right, what they didn't get right. Um, one thing I think hasn't been talked about much in the commentary I saw is if you look back at the movie, even in this world of hoverboards and flying cars and uh, the equivalent of Skype and Google Glass, et cetera, there was this predominance uh, on paper. Um, so all of these uh, technologies, the instant message type technologies, existed on paper. Granted, paper was coming out of the walls and was portable and all that stuff. Um, but one of the things the producers didn't see is that even though that was a predominant technology at the time, remember this is the mid to late 80s, fax machines were the cutting edge technology of the time. They were in some ways unable to see past that being the way that technology would evolve in the future. And this is, I think, a pretty common mistake that we make in the technology industry or whenever we're trying to project the future. We tend to overestimate the platform that's most popular today. It happens time and time again. This is, um, sorry for the, the low quality video here, but this is from April 2007, yeah, Steve Ballmer being interviewed about the iPhone. Zoom, if, if I may. Zoom uh, was getting some traction and Steve Jobs goes to Macworld and he, he pulls out this iPhone. What was your first reaction when you saw that? $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world. 
and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. So in this case, it's keyboards. It's something that we had become so used to from PCs and from Blackberries that it was inconceivable that we would see past this. Um, before I close, I wanted to talk about one example of where mobile may be going. This is a very specific example, but I think it's a great example of thinking past um, the way that mobile technology exists today, thinking past mobile phones and even wearables in the traditional sense. And it's a story about a 15-year-old boy from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, his grandfather, like five million or so other Americans, had Alzheimer's disease. And one of the problems with Alzheimer's patients and one of the problems they typically have is that they can wander off and this causes other very serious health issues. So this 15-year-old boy thought through a way to embed socks that his grandfather wore every day with a sensor device that had a very, very thin battery and was kind of embedded into the socks that would then alert uh, his caregiver if he were up, if he were walking around, if he had left a sp specific perimeter. Um, so in a sense, this is looking past today's technology. This isn't a plastic bracelet that may not appeal to an elderly person. Uh, he thought through a new form factor. He redefined what wearable technology means and I think um, in many ways embodies the power of what's ahead. So in closing, I want to go back to one uh, commentator I saw when I was doing some research on Back to the Future. Um, they basically said, this commentator, that Back to the Future, like a lot of movies at the time, and granted, this is not the most serious of movies, it was a comedy, uh, but it's very typical in movie making that when you're looking forward to the future and when you're projecting out what that future will look like, you have to make it recognizable to the present. It throws people off if you change too much, if you uh, view fundamentally different underlying technology than what exists today. I guess I want to close by saying we in technology have the luxury not to do that. And in fact, I think it's our job. Thank you, everyone.